Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Craig Shelley. I'm a managing director at Org Group. Um, thank you very much for joining what I think is our eighth or ninth uh, weekly webinar since uh, the world got turned upside down. Um, for those of you that are here for the first time, um, basically, we're just going to have a little bit of a conversation around things that uh, have been interesting to us in the sector and that we've been seeing and experiencing. Um, for those of you that have been uh, with us before, um, you'll notice uh, one change is uh, Steve is not going to moderate today. The, I, I, I will be your, your, your host for the next uh, hour-ish of fun and adventure. Um, I've been with Org Group about seven years. Um, I'm managing director. I work with a number of organizations um, that we partner with help design the strategies of our engagement, um, partner with the CEOs of organizations and, and leadership to, to, to help them sort of make decisions, um, and then work with our fantastic staff to, to sort of execute on, on what we're trying to do every day. Um, prior to that, I spent most of my career with the Boy Scouts. I was the national head of fundraising there, was a CEO there, uh, chief development officer at a local council there. Um, so that's sort of where, where I come from. I'm joined today by uh, some wonderful friends and colleagues um, that I'll introduce you to in a minute, but wanted to set sort of some frame or tone or context around where we're going to start our conversation today. Um, and as you want to participate in our conversation, you'll see at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A box. Click in there, put in a question, um, and we'll try and, uh, and, and try and get to it. But I think, you know, as we've been thinking about things, some things are becoming very certain, right? That they're gonna stay the way they are, that they're gonna be certain ways going forward. So a few sort of things that are being understood from our perspective, um, you know, we're gonna be raising money for some period of time, if not in quarantine, um, certainly within the context of an economic downturn, right? We will eventually all you know, be out of our homes, um, but the economy, um, we're still gonna be in a circumstance that is different than where we were a year ago. Um, where and how we raise money um, is gonna change, right? Opportunities shift. Um, there's people that had a lot of money that now don't. There's people that didn't that now do. Um, you know, events, you know, that's an interesting sort of, sort of picture in and of itself in the short and long term. Major gifts, annual giving, support, communications. Um, I think there's gonna be opportunities that present themselves that change all of those things um, in terms of how we staff and, and, and how we raise, raise our funds. Um, Many nonprofits are going to come out of this having made cuts to their budgets, right? Reducing costs um, is something that's on everybody's mind. So some people are going to come through the other side of this, whatever that looks like, with a smaller team than they had now. Um, I think that's becoming evident, while at the same time, their need for philanthropy is going to be through the roof. Um, one of the unique parts of this particular crisis has been those with the most diverse revenue streams and earned revenue streams in many cases have been hurt worse than those that were dependent exclusively on philanthropy. But either way, we're all gonna need, need, need more money and in many cases have less, less, less staff to do it. Um, and then I think the other thing that we've been thinking a lot about as a team has been the sector has always had a talent shortage, right? There's never been enough really good fundraisers um, to fill the need. But ironically, there's gonna be a lot of talent that's suddenly available, right? So while people are thinking differently about spending money, there might be an opportunity to sort of scoop up some, some talent that you didn't previously have access to. So all those things are going on in the background um, and that'll sort of be where we start our conversation. Again, you can join in on the Q&A function. Let me introduce you uh, to the wonderful folks that uh, will be, be speaking with us today. Um, first and foremost, um, Steve Orr. Steve is the co-founder and managing partner of our firm. Um, I walked into his office about seven years ago trying to find something else to do. Um, thought he was a little bit crazy. Um, but have come forward since then and realized um, every day I have learned from him, right? So brings a unique perspective having come from investment banking, Goldman Sachs, for-profit, entrepreneur, um, started a nonprofit, just had a very different perspective than the one that I bring to the table. Um, but it's been amazing to sort of watch and, and, and he's helped me think bigger and, and be bigger than, than I think I was when I met Steve seven years ago. So he'll have a lot to add to this conversation shortly. Um, Kelly Dunphy, um, also a managing director at the firm. Um, similarly, I met Kelly on the exact same day that I met Steve. Um, and then when we used to do things like have offices, we had adjoining offices for, for many years. Um, and despite my bouncing a ball against the wall all the time, um, she befriended me and helped me uh, understand what was different about my new life working at Org Group as opposed to my prior life as a frontline fundraiser. Um, always had the patience to help me become a better professional. Um, and sort of see where the opportunities were. Prior to Org Group, where she's been for 13 years, I think, 
Um, she was at Share Our Strength, um, helping their fundraising there. Um, so just a really, um, has seen it all literally in 13 years and uh, another person I continue to learn from every day. So I'm excited that you all will get to learn from her today. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, Rina Cialoni, Regina Cialoni. I, uh, I'm so worried about saying your last name the right way that I, I said your first name the wrong way. Um, but uh, Regina is a fantastic Tom, has been with us for uh, I guess two and a half, three years now at this point, um, a senior director at the firm. Um, one of the things that always struck me as odd when I first met Regina, um, we both grew up in Queens. Um, we went to brother and sister high schools at the time. My, my school was all boys, her school was all girls. They were really near each other. We're like a year or two apart. I could never figure out how we had not managed to meet. Um, but now that I've worked with Regina, I know exactly why we haven't met because she is a true student, right? Like she is constantly learning and growing and evolving. And I have no doubt was doing that in high school when I was not. So um, that's why we, we managed not to cross paths when we were younger, but I'm glad we've crossed paths now. Just a really great fundraiser. Um, so again, Q&A at the bottom. If you have any tech issues, you can pop that into the chat function on the side and we'll try and help you out. And away we go. Um, so again, you know, things are gonna be different sort of short-term, long-term in fundraising. Um, there's always a question like what's sort of permanently different again you know events are sort of thing that's been top of mind in the last couple of months that's that, that, that that's clearly going to be different but kelly i'm curious you know what what are you seeing out there right now you know what areas of fundraising do you see performing particularly well um what conclusions are you drawing about you know talents we're going to need on teams going forward based on changes in fundraising um and just where are you sort of directing your attention right yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, <clears throat> that was a great intro, by the way. I'm going to pay you to do that for me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, I think the biggest trend I'm seeing right now is that no one really knows what the next year is going to look like, except that we know it will look very different than perhaps any time in the recent history of your organization and our industry overall, um, and that we need to really face into that and be open to continued flexibility and the need to pivot as the landscape really continues to evolve and how excellent leadership is vital to guiding nonprofits through this kind of unprecedented situation because it's going to involve some really tough decisions and ability to come up with new ideas and just taking a fresh look at everything you've done, you've been doing. Um, that said, uh, you know, in the short term, I would say in you know, the last two, two and a half months since this has all started, we're starting to see some findings coming out um, and in the industry overall, but also with the organizations we work with in particular, you know, we're seeing direct response actually do really well, as well as overall donor engagement from major donors to mid-level donors and so forth. Um, we also see campaigns or organizations making the decision to continue with their campaigns, albeit probably with an adjusted timeline. Uh, you know, events, as we know, are really hurting and will likely continue to be seriously impacted for another year and in some cases certain types of events may never fully recover from this and so organizations whose model has really um you know survived off a certain event model for a long time they're in a really tough situation right now and they're going to have to face into how they adjust their model and then thus their resources of staff around this new longer term reality um, just a couple of quick things on um, event staffing. So, you know, I think that's really kind of the hardest hit area as I was saying. And so a question I think a lot of organizations are wrestling with, you know, we're projecting our events to be way down for the next year um, and maybe for the future becoming, you know, a smaller piece of the pie overall. How, what do we do with our event team, right? Um, and this is something I've, we've been doing a lot of work in actually pre-COVID for the last couple of years, just coming into organizations like this and working with them on how to pivot from a more event-driven organization to a much you know, broader array of fundraising initiatives, particularly in the areas of, of major giving and other types of philanthropy. And so what we've also done is take a look at event staff um, and you know, even though it's more transactional giving in nature, event staff have really great relationship skills, right? And that is at the heart of any kind of fundraiser. You need that really solid core of relationship building skills 
So we've worked with organizations where we've been able to transition some event staff actually over to the major gifts team and it's worked really well. So I would encourage organizations where you're, if you're making a decision to invest more on the philanthropy side, look at the talent that you do have on the event side and see where you might make need be able to make some transition. I think, I mean, that's a really great point. And I know all four of us, one way or another, sort of cut our teeth in fundraising around special events. And I've always told people like, there's no better way to learn how to fundraise because you're asking lots of people for money quickly, right? So you kind of get that experience. There's a lot of detail involved. You have to understand your organization. Like, so it's a great way to become a fundraiser. Um, so yeah, I think that there's a lot of talent there and, uh, you know, they haven't just been picking out napkin colors all these years, right? So like it, it's, it's to be able to repurpose that. And I think it allows you to hold on to it for when I think we all hope that that, that stream of fundraising comes back. Um, so Steve, uh, you've been the CEO of multiple organizations through the years, including ours, obviously. Um, when you look at the current environment, think about some of that context that Kelly just told us about what's changing. You know, what, do, what sort of decisions around staffing are, are, are you thinking about? Are you discussing with sort of the nonprofits and the CEOs that you partner with? And you know, how, how do you think people should be considering their fundraising staff needs you know, as, as they move beyond this? Well, first, thanks for the introduction, Craig. I would just count about 50% of that, but it's always, always nice to hear. Um, I also just had to jump up because I've got this huge lawnmower outside my uh, window, so all good. But welcome, everybody. Um, yes, changing times and fundraising staff issues. I think I always start with the issue of it's, a, it's imperative at this moment that leadership come through, really at all levels, but being a CEO myself and talk, speaking with a lot of CEOs, a regular basis, it really you know comes down for me to how am I going to keep my team motivated, and I think everyone needs to be thinking about that. Uh, and of course, there are a number of techniques you know that that we all employ to do that. But it you know regular engagement by leadership is absolutely vital. Um, being creative, doing different things, engaging, um, forcing others to engage, um, in, enticing others to share ideas. Those are all you know really great techniques. Um, and, you know, making that maybe people feel useful and creative about what they would normally be doing and what perhaps in the future is going to become the new normal, you know, as a team figure out what, you know, answers to these questions that we're debating right now. So I think there's a lot of techniques there and I think it's paramount that we do that. Another big area for me is launching new product projects uh, to uh, A, keep people motivated, uh, but B, what I call PPP time. Uh, you know, through June, this is a, an opportunity we all need to keep, you all need to keep your head counts up. Uh, and, there, and there probably is a, a bit of excess time, unless you've gone through, you know, major layoffs. But it's a great time to motivate through thinking about new projects. Um, and some might say, well, you know, we missed the boat on that. I don't think so. You know, this is going to go on not just through June, but it's going to be slower probably through the summer, you know, in terms of direct fundraising asks. So I think projects could, you know, could, could be the, could span the, a huge array of issues, you know, from fixing databases to, that you haven't had time to do, to, you know, doing a lot more research on donors, to doing a lot more in the communication category. So at our company, we're, we've, I've launched a number of these initiatives and everybody's involved and it's, it is motivating. Uh, it gives everyone a stake in the future and it's all very productive stuff. And then a huge category I think is the whole communication piece. If you've listened to our webinars at all through the process, I remember in our first one, we talked most importantly about communicating. And I do, I still think that's important. And every webinar since we've talked more and more about it because, and I hear clients uh, and uh, partners talking about how effective it is to just communicate. People want to speak. Um, and that communication many times, you know, transforms into interest in, you know, your charitable cause and possibly even donating to that cause. Uh, I think now we're entering a phase where it's absolutely transitions to that. And I guess the last thing I would say in terms of, you know, staffing shifts, there is a lot of change going on right now. There's firing, there's hiring, attempts at hiring. I think Craig's point about talent being available is true, um, but it's difficult because people are, you know, either somewhere between insecure about taking a new job and or uh, just wanting to take some time off because of the stress involved right now. 
but it is a good time to restructure, to Kelly's point. It is absolutely a great time. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that through the course of today, but restructuring at this moment is the most brilliant uh, suggestion I could make to you right now. Excellent. I think, you know, but really pull through sort of all those observations, like it's all about sort of thinking about the future, looking towards the future, like that's much more motivating than looking at the end of your nose. And, and just it's, it's that sort of longer view um, is so critical right now, more, more, more than probably, probably anything. Um, so Regina, you've been in senior roles and, you know, nonprofits throughout your career. Um, you're providing leadership in a set of nonprofits as part of your work with Org Group right now. Um, what skills do you think are sort of most important for fundraising staff right now? And like, sort of, what are you looking at and, and thinking about in, in those terms? A CEO once said to me that there are two kinds of fundraisers. There are hunters and there are farmers. And I think right now I'd be looking for the farmers, the people who are going to be the great relationship builders, who are the good storytellers, who can communicate your mission. Uh, and also at the same time, be active listeners and engage with donors with empathy and authenticity. Uh, I once met a brilliant fundraiser who may or may not be in this webinar who called me scrappy. And I, at first it sounded like a backhanded compliment until I realized what was meant was that, you know, the fundraising style that I had was one of entrepreneurship and resourcefulness. And uh, I think that that's very important right now to be looking for fundraisers and professionals that are resourceful, that can um, adapt. Uh, so beyond accommodate, beyond just get used to this next normal and work with it to adapt is to really just thrive in this next normal. Uh, and, you know, I think resourceful people are going to turn challenges into advantages. And those are the people that you, I'd be looking for in those skills. Yeah, another, I mean, just like when you really think about like one of the things I've observed for sure is people that are not resourceful or not self-motivated, my mind generally weren't great fundraisers, but now like, you know, those B players are becoming D players, you know, like that, because like you, 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 there's no room for micromanaging people in the environment we're all in because of the crisis, because of the speed, because we're working from home. So like if you're not scrappy, um, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get left, 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 left behind. Um, I always think of like uh, the like the little dog and Scooby Doo, like Scooby Doo's little buddy, buddy Scrap, Scrappy, whatever his name was. I'm I, glad you said it. Not, no, no. <laughs> I, was, I would now can't get that quote out of my head. But um, all right, so Kelly, I think underlying all of this is like there's opportunities here. You're thinking about things differently. There's going to be restructuring, reconfiguring. Um, as Steve said, this is actually a good time to do that kind of thing, especially if you factor in like, oh, there could be talent available to you. Like, so there's all these things going on. Like. How you know, do you think organizations should be thinking about sort of reconfiguring their approach to, 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 to fundraising? Yeah, and the last two and a half months have two and a half months have been, you know, sort of active response mode, um, a really critical period where some of us had to make choices for how to even just keep our doors open, and some of us may even still be going through that. And and that kind of intense environment, it can be really hard to step sideways and you know take the time to think about how do we reconfigure and um, how is this allowing us to drive innovation <clears throat> but I think it's really so critical to take the time to do that so you can navigate a path forward beyond you know the next 60 days and then the next 60 days um, so I think a, you know a planning process can help you do a number of things one is take a fresh look at uh, your case for support and how you position the need that your organization was founded to address. Um, it can finally force you to diversify your revenue or overall business model where, you know, it's something that seemed so hard before and it, and it is hard, um, but now you really have no choice to face into that. Um, and it forces you to ask those hard questions, you know, what's going to work? Where's the risk? What do we need to do differently now to accomplish our mission? How does our staffing need to change? How do we need to build our strength in new areas? Um, so the point is that um, you know, we're recommending that you intentionally schedule time with your leadership team to take a renewed look at literally everything that you're doing and, and then plan for different scenarios. Because again, what I was saying at the beginning of this is that we don't know what the next year is truly going to look like. I mean, we're organizations whose fiscal years end June 30th, you know, are deep in budgeting process right now. And you're being forced to put a plan together when you don't really know what next year is going to look like. Um, 
So having those different scenarios in mind, and I think making it clear to your board that this is the, the situation we're in right now, and this is you know the best we can do, and we're planning for these different scenarios, that's, that's really important. Yeah, there's that whole sort of as people are, uh, that are on the sort of the fiscal years that are ending now or sort of over the summer into the fall, which is a lot of you, um, which is for the record, I never fully understand why we have so many different fiscal years, but that's a different webinar that no one would want to tune into. But um, but like uh, like those are the, a lot of people are talking about budgets right now. We're getting a lot of questions of like, how should we project fundraising? And, you know, th there's always been far more guesswork and fundraising projecting than most people are comfortable with because it's not you know we can move 25 widgets right there's a lot of things going on there but right now it's like right like it's i can tell you it's not going to be zero and it's probably going to be less than you need right like it's going to be somewhere in between and you're going to have to look at what does your pipeline look like and what does your history look like and all these those factors and then probably you know discount it a little bit but um yeah i i, I think taking the opportunity to look ahead figure out how you want to be different. I mean, one of the things you touched on that was exciting to me was like, there are things you know you need to deal with and you've never dealt with them. Well, now you have to deal with them, right? Like, right. you know, the, the, all these sort of underlying issues, you can't keep them, you can't ignore them any longer because now we're in sort of down to brass tacks. Right, and, and you know, one thing I was thinking of recently was, you know, a crisis of this magnitude, I think has shown some of us how critical a reserve fund is or you know an endowment is um, and how it can really help you navigate through something like this in the future hopefully you don't have this again in the future but as part of your planning for like the the you know just the next year what steps could you build into that plan for how to start to either start an endowment or reserve fund or grow upon what you've already doing and how does that become more of a priority for you yeah, no, it's been one of the one of the true inequities of all of this is going to be that a big a big sort of marker of success is how much cash did you have in the bank on on you know February 29th, right? Like, and, and if you had a good amount of cash, you could probably afford some bad decisions through this and you'll be fine. But if you didn't, if you don't make every single decision exactly sort of thread the needle, um, you're gonna you're, you're gonna be struggling. But I, I, and the issue of building endowments, like we talk a lot about plan giving as a huge opportunity, like. People always get agitated around like, well, what about if I need cash now? Like, well, if you're starting to figure out how to replenish your endowment, like this is a great time to be out there talking, plan, giving, and you know, just knowing that that pipeline is, 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 is coming. I want to shift a little bit to you know, one of the things that could be a solution to organizations. You know, Steve, you've long sort of advocated for this idea of sort of outsourcing functions that weren't you know, sort of key or core to, to, to an organization's mission. Um, and at least in my mind, from the fundraising end, you've really sort of pioneered it, um, or at least proven how it can work at scale. I've seen other people do it. I haven't seen a lot of people be able to do it and have an ROI that maybe, you know, sort of economics work for the provider and the nonprofit. Um, I feel like I'm being overly nice to you on this webinar generally, so we should replay this around review time. But, um, you know, how should nonprofit leaders be thinking about sort of out, outsourcing functions generally right now? And, you know, and particularly in fundraising, you know, how does somebody know if the circumstances are right for them than, than to be looking for some sort of outsourced solution? Yeah, so first a little history. Um, you know, I've been in the business now for almost 30 years, you know, came from a for-profit uh, background. And, you know, outsourcing was a very common thing, uh, whether it was in finance or in manufacturing or whatever come to this industry, nonprofit industry, and it was complete anathema as an idea, you know, particularly in fundraising, because I wouldn't hand over my donor relationships to be managed by someone on the outside. Well, that has come a long way, let me assure you. So my vision, uh, going back 30 years, because I came in with a very practical point of view of saying, what does the industry need? It needs a lot more help raising a lot more money from professional people. And there's really you know, it's really not a professional fundraising track that you go to school to learn, then, you know, bring it into the industry. So um, the idea of outsourcing essentially is that you are partnering with uh, somebody or a firm like ours to help you and partner with you. We call it the embedded uh, service or the embedded partnership, because what we do is really become part of the team. We can become the team, but more commonly it's becoming part of the team. And that might be at a leadership function, or it might be um, you know, assisting uh, in more back office kinds of things. 
Um, but the concept of outsourcing is fairly straightforward, but the way in which it's done and the uniqueness is not easy. And, and I, I've always wondered why, you know, other firms and other people don't spend more time in this category. And I learned the hard way, which is the answer is that it's very hard to do and you need really, really high quality people with a lot of experience. So if I look at the three others on this call and then I look around our firm at the other 50 people or so, everybody, not everybody, but most people come in with a great deal of other experience at nonprofits directly in the fundraising category so that you bring those experiences in and it helps enormously, you know, to be able to view properly as, you know, what's the situation at this particular partnerships uh, and how can I help? And then the question comes around always to, you know, is it really needed now more than ever or just the opposite? You know, do I really concentrate on my own staff? And, you know, I mean, it's to my own benefit, of course, to say, oh my gosh, the need is greater now than ever. But I think there's a pretty solid case for that because, you know, there's turnover going on. There's a lot of layoffs going on in the fundraising categories because for some strange reason, uh, boards feel, oh, uh, let's cut costs. So let's cut our fundraising staff. Probably the wrong move because you're cutting off sort of your lifeline to uh, your, your donate, your, uh, your relationships and that type of thing. So, but take, you know, going to a group who can come in with a team day one, be productive, raise money or teach the, the remaining staff or new staff, you know, how to proceed with that is hugely advantageous. We see it every day and that's why we continue to be busy. Uh, you know, we've not done major layoffs. We've not done, uh, you know, we want to be, we are ready. We have been ready. We are filling new, new uh, needs right now and, you know, ready to do that. Um, and so, uh, Craig, I want to flip it back to you for a sec, because you, as you described in your opening, you know, you came with 16 years of frontline experience, and then you took over, you know, as the head of development for a major national organization. How do you feel now, you know, being the person who runs from, you know, one embedded client relationship situation to another? What's that experience like? And were you prepared for that? And how do you feel about it now? Yeah, so it's interesting. One of, and we were sort of early days of doing a lot of it. Um, when I got here, there just sort of been this big relationship with the American Red Cross at one point, like, and that we were starting to do a lot of it. And actually it was one of the things that appealed to me because when I was at the Boy Scouts, we had a talent issue in fundraising, like everybody did. And we had really tried hard to find a solution where we could actually outsource fundraising staff um, to a lot of the, the smaller sort of Boy Scout councils, local nonprofits that didn't really have access to the talent or couldn't afford it. And I could not find a cost effective way to do it, right? Like particularly where I really needed to do it, right? I didn't need to do it in New York. I needed to do it in you know, Tupelo, Mississippi, right? Like, so we couldn't sort of make the economics of it work. So actually when I first looked at what was then OAI and I saw that you were doing a lot of it, I selfishly was like, I got to figure out how this works because I know that there's a market for it because I could see it. Like if I could have found somebody to do it right at the, at the Boy Scouts, we'd have gone gangbusters with it. And I, and I just couldn't, couldn't find anybody that could do it. A lot of people pitched me on it and they couldn't do it. So when I came here, one, that's one of the reasons I came. Two, it took you know a, a while to sort of get under the hood and figure out why it was working for us. But Steve, you're right, the secret was talent. Um, and I always was concerned was, could we scale the talent? Um, and so far we have, right? You know, from, from that time seven years ago to today, there's a lot more of us and I don't think our talent has, has suffered at all. Um, so that was sort of some ways I've looked at it. The other ways in terms of like actually going in and doing the work, which I did a ton of when I first started. And I was concerned, like, how could I be the chief development officer here and the chief development officer there? One, you know, the way we work in teams really made that possible in a unique way that I could not appreciate till I did it. But more importantly to me was I figured out that there was a lot of things that I paid attention to that were irrelevant, right? Like in sort of an outsource model, when you're sort of coming in with a one distinct task, you're not worried about sort of the, the, the politics of the, the, the dude that delivers the mail, right? And you're not worried about sort of like all these other things and you, you, you just have an ability like this is my function and this is what I'm going to drive. Um, and that to me has been an amazing thing for me just to realize like there are 10 things in front of you, only three of them matter. If you could figure out which three those are and do those, that's all anybody's going to care about because that's going to move the, the, the needle. So it's been, it's been. Hey, uh, Craig, if I, can I just comment on your team uh, reference there? 
uh, Kelly, you and I went into an organization starting, what, two years ago, and I was the outsourced CEO, CEO, you were the outsourced COO, and then we had another eight team members performing other leadership and just, you know, regular functions. The only way this stuff works is to understand and embrace the team structure. And actually, frankly, I came from an environment um, at Goldman Sachs that was total team, and I learned how to do that, and I've applied it here, and I, I hope I would hear from all my colleagues that... That is key to the process. And what do you do in team? You, you trust, you collaborate, you communicate, you, you know, it's a cultural thing. So I think what I hear from people who we work with all the time is I like working with you guys because it teaches me or helps me think about my own culture. And that is, I mean, I hear that all the time and I'm so proud of that. And if we can help in that category, it's, it's terrific. But I think, that, I think that's really important. Kelly, don't you think so? I mean, we've worked on so many assignments together where that's been critical. And, and Craig, yeah. I'm just not moderating now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I agree. It yeah. was inevitable that that was going to happen. So. <laughs> um, I will just add that, yes, the culture piece is so important. And I, I think, um, you know, uh, the right kind of outsourced solution to you is one that I think blends the two cultures. I think it, it's just the only way it works is if when you come in, you really understand the culture you're coming into and then seeing the strengths um, of our culture and their culture and where the gaps might be and how we can um, impact that for the long term. Um, so yeah, that's what I would add. Yeah, it was just having that conversation with somebody in our team yesterday around sort of like, there is a chameleon aspect of this, right? Like we, we, we change the cultures we become a part of which I think any good leader does, but bad leaders, and certainly where we, you know, when we don't do it right, is when you try and force the culture of a place to change, like immediately, right? Like, you know, culture can't be dictated on day one of like, great, we're all going to now be team focused, or great, we're now all going to be detail oriented, or great, we're all going to care about the customer, right? But you can come into a place, understand that culture, sort of become a part of it, and then influence it in ways that, um, that, that, that improve it. And I think, you know, however you come into an organization, that's something to be super, super mindful of. Um, I want to take a question that was on here before we move too far off of this outsourcing conversation. Um, I don't fully get sort of the, so the question is, you know, what are the, in regards to outsourcing staffing, you know, should I be concerned about, you know, unrelated business income tax implications? I'm not sure how UBIT what applies here. So hopefully someone's going to have an idea. I would tell you generally my view on, on you because it comes up a lot in organizations is like relax. Like if it's generating more revenue for you that they want to tax, just budget that you're going to have to pay the tax. Like it's not, you know, the same way I look at like paying my own taxes. I don't love it, but it's the cost of doing business, right? So if you can scale your income enough that all of a sudden you bits an issue, you just have to plan to pay the tax, right? It's, it's not going to be that crazy unless you spend all the money, don't plan to pay the tax, and then, you know, the, the tax man comes looking. But I don't know, Steve, do you have a sense of you? Yeah, I hate to person? say the word never, but I don't believe I have ever heard that being a concern, you know, at the nonprofit level, because I just don't think that's an issue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah with respect to outsourcing, I mean, uh, these, this is the team you're hiring to raise philanthropic revenue, usually most of the time, I would think. So I don't think this um, would be a concern. Yeah, you're not really hiring people that are unrelated to do things that are unrelated to your business, right? People get into it when they, you know, sort of start a for-profit line or they're doing a product sale and I guess there's certain scale, that kind of stuff. Um, all right, last thing sort of before we move off of sort of outsourcing. Kelly, is there anything else you would add, you know, of, of, of how it's a beneficial option you know, for a situation right now, like where you're in a lot of uncertainty, why in particular could this be the kind of solution that, that works for you? Yeah, um, you know, I would add with this uncertainty, you know, you may experience burnout at the staff level. I mean, it's a very stressful time period, right? Um, and you might lose some people, um, like your chief development officer, director of development, director of major gifts, whatever it might be. And so this can be a real immediate solution where somebody or a team can come, you know, right in and pick up the reins. Um, and then, you know, Craig, I think you made a really good point about the ability to really stay focused on, you know, a primary scope with very clear goals and expectations. And at the same time, you know, if your partner here is not, you know, if the results aren't there and they're not meeting the goals that you set out, it's, 
oftentimes a lot easier to cut ties with, you know, the outsourcing partner than it is to turn over, you know, full-time employees. So there's, you know, it can be more cost effective um, if things are going well. And if things aren't going well, you know, it's easier to, you know, move on. No, I think right, and that lack of you know, the, the not you're not investing in the training of people, you're not sort of stuck exactly in unemployment, you know, with it doesn't go right, all those things. All right, let's sort of go in a slightly different direction now. So you know, one of the other things we said at the beginning is like definitely happening. Um, Regina, you've worked in lots of different nonprofits at all different sizes um, over a, a good long period of time. Like me, I, I know you sort of roll your eyes at this idea, like, well, you're just going to have to do more with less. Um, but frankly, there are a lot of organizations telling their steps right now, you're just going to have to do more with less. Um, so what advice, you know, would you be giving to people or are you giving to people, you know, that their expectations aren't going to change, but their staffs, their budgets, they're going to be smaller, but they got to do the same work. What, 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 how are you thinking about that? I think that task seems insanely difficult, insanely complicated, uh, at first. So I'm going to borrow some advice from Douglas Adams. Don't panic. Uh, realize that it's impossible to do everything, to be everyone, to, to get it all done. You're, if you are a small shop, if you were a big shop that's now become a small shop, you won't be able to successfully, you know, do proposals, major, major donors, uh, special events, plan giving. You, you can't do it all. So one is, you know, eliminate as many distractions as possible. Uh, what you were saying earlier, Craig, about, you know, working in consultancies and, and being able to hear the 10 things in front of me, what are the three things that are going to, you know, have the greatest results and the biggest impact, not only in the, right now, but also in the future. So eliminate distractions and focus on engagement and focus on connecting. That's the most important and tangible advice I can give right now. So if, to the extent that you're able, spend more one-on-one -on -one time with your prospects and donors. Have a goal that you will have this many conversations with donors per day, every single day. You'll pick up the phone or email a donor to reach out to them. Um, and, and again, to that end, be, meet them where they're at. Ask them how they'd like to, to talk to you. Some are more comfortable via phone. Some are more comfortable via email. Some don't want to hear from you at all. But again, we make no assumptions for our donors. We ask ask and ask and ask and ask. Um, and then also keep in mind, don't miss this opportunity to steward new donors. So a lot of organizations, especially those that are on the front lines or those that are having successful campaigns, be it uh, virtual galas or social media, et cetera, they, they're seeing this influx of new donors that are coming into their cause. And importantly, we want to focus on uh, stewarding our current donors, but that pool is going to be tomorrow's major donors, right? That, that pool of people who are coming in now. So don't forget and don't ignore and definitely put the time that's needed uh, for each new membership that comes in. If you have the time, pick up the phone and say thank you, be it $25 or $100. We have, we have time now to, to really focus again on those in, on engaging activities. And then set realistic expectations. You might be converting to a digital gala, but the likelihood of raising as much funds as you have previously for your in-person events uh, is, is very low, right? It's very unlikely. So realize that you're going to be putting forth a number of efforts. You're going to be creative. You're going to be trying different things. But realistically, what are your projections? What are your goals? And Ideally, you want to be as creative as possible and you want to make it work. No is not an option. Your organization, your mission is important. It has to happen. Not, not helping, not getting it done, not finding that funding, not an option. So roll up your sleeves, make it work, um, and be as adaptable and courageous as you possibly can be. Just like Scrappy do. Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree, right? Like to me, there is not, I mean, I'm never a person that really loves to hear sort of like, you know, know where that can't be done. But sort of, you're right, right? Like right now, like that's not an option. Like whatever it's going to take, this is what we're going to do. Um, yeah, you have to be realistic, but like it can't be sort of a, a Debbie, a Debbie Downer um, in this sort of environment. Um, Steve, I want to uh, sort of, one of the things I know that I'm hearing a lot about is sort of like, there's all these decisions people are grappling with. How are they going to staff their fundraising going forward? Where should they invest? Where should they, they cut back? And boards, you know, have a big opinion about this. And as they should, you know, weigh in on sort of strategic decisions, have to approve budgets. Um, you know, what advice are you giving to people now, you know, that are in the midst of sort of advocating with their boards around like we have to maintain or, or perhaps even increase, you know, our investment in fundraising? Um, how, what, what do you, how, how would you advise people to? Yeah, so the, 
You're asking the question about board interaction, board commitment. Um, how do you encourage the board to understand that, my gosh, if there's ever a time to invest in change and in new structures, this is it. And I mean, it seems obvious, I guess, to fundraisers, but not always to boards. So we always like to think of it in terms of, you know, we've been meaning to restructure this organization for the longest time. Imagine if you're a think tank and your revenues principally come from convening really thoughtful people on really dynamic topics and you, you sell sponsorships and you've got you know, all the usual things. And there are a lot of organizations in that category. You can't convene for the next six to 12 months. That's a problem. So, and if you're a national health uh, organization that has chapters all over the country and that you're accustomed to golf tournaments and walks and runs and galas and those type of things to account for 50 to 75% of your revenue, that's gonna be a problem. So. I know the process has already begun of thinking out, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? Well, restructuring is a nice sort of category to say that's the analytical process to actually figure out what's working in that paradigm, if any of it, and what's not, and then what should we move to to replace that revenue and to grow quickly in other directions. So I love the idea of stepping sideways for a minute, restructuring, and the board's got to buy that. The board's gotta be directly involved with that, has to not only endorse it, but be involved. And then sort of looking internally, that's going to lead to changes like staff changes. Um, you know, as functionality changes, needs change. Can event folks transition to major gift donors? Absolutely. And we've done that. Kelly, you and I just did that uh, for two years with this one organization. Uh, but it's hard and it requires training and it requires coaching and it requires day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, oversight and all that good stuff. So it's expensive. Uh, it takes time, internal staff time. Uh, it's recruitment time, typically, training time, all that stuff. And then the other thing is, uh, which is now an external piece, and, and Regina, you were talking about this, is investing in those relationships. It's not going to be as productive in the very short term in terms of dollars raised, but it, I guarantee it will be productive in the longer term, medium and longer term. I was on with a major hospital uh, uh, individual two days ago, I think it was, yeah, in New York, and this person was saying, you know, we've been out aggressively talking and communicating, uh, at which everyone agrees, I think, is a wise thing. And we, we decided, let's just not, you know, move to the asking portion anytime soon. And what they found is, well, they're a hospital and they're on the ground, that all the inquiries started coming back to them. How can we help? How, we want to fund you. We want to help. What can we do? What's the right thing? That's a pretty interesting phenomenon when you think about it. Now, a little unfair because they're on the ground, healthcare in that space, but so many of us in the nonprofit space are, are, are directly related or one step away from COVID impact. So, you know, being able to relate to people in a way that they, they care about and they can see the urgency of really important stuff, but it takes time, which means it costs money and investment. The boards have got to be behind that process. So one last thing, educating the board, you know, on, what is this all about? Why do I have to be doing this? What does this all mean to me? You know, if we could run the, this webinar in front of the board saying, board, you need to be thinking about these things right now with us because we're thinking about these things. We're going to find solutions and you want to be part of the solution. I think, you know, and that, that, that on, obviously, like I think the um, a thing that I've been saying a lot and sort of struggling with a lot is like board members, you know, have to be careful not to project their own circumstances into your nonprofit, right? So you mentioned like, I mean, and I agree, we are seeing people give, right? People are not not giving. Um, but a lot of board members, particularly if they're in an industry that's been really hard hit, their assumption is like, hey, I just let go 50% of my staff. You need to be doing the exact same thing. And you might be, right? Like, I don't know. Every, your circumstances and your organization are different. Just like I shouldn't project our circumstances on you, board members need to be careful about that too. But again, you have to have a relationship of trust you have to have a relationship of educating them. They have to understand your business or else they're gonna fall back on their experience, which is, hey, my business is in trouble, your business must be in trouble. Um, yeah, and, and Craig, a great example of that is we have, as you well know, one of our very significant long range clients is in the hospitality space, which has been decimated short term. But you know, they were gonna do a gala, we canceled the gala, but we continued with the fundraising. And I just got a report uh, this week that my gosh, everyone's still giving even in difficult times, they understand the horsepower behind the charity. They, they want, you know, the relationship is strong. Uh, all the things we're talking about in terms of technique have been employed. It's a wonderful, wonderful outcome. And th those are, that's much more 
the story right now than the opposite. I can't, you know, I'm, I'm suffering in my business. Yeah, I'm going to project that on you. You should be suffering. You should cut your expenses, all of that, you know, but it takes management. Yeah. And I think, so one of the things that I've been found it interestingly, that's from, from well and Kelly and I, you and I have spoken about this quite a bit because I think it's caught a little, I think it caught both of us off guard a little bit as we spent probably much of our careers uh, with our noses turned up at sort of direct mail and direct marketing as a fundraising source. But I'll tell you, like I'm seeing everywhere I turn where people that have a lot of it are doing pretty good. So I don't know, how are you thinking about that and, and what sort of light bulbs have gone off for you on, 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 on that subject? Yeah, I'm hearing in sort of the nonprofit industry media and also directly from organizations we work with that uh, a lot of them have kept up their direct response programs. Um, and from, you know, multi-channel from mail to uh, email to social media, and they're really seeing excellent results. And one organization told me last week that they've actually exceeded their pre-COVID goals for direct mail. Um, and so we're seeing organizations include, you know, a relevant messaging to mailings they already had planned or actually adding in new mailings and getting a really good return. And you know, for those organizations whose missions are you know, kind of directly impacted. They're sort of front and center because of coronavirus. But even those organizations whose missions are maybe more indirectly connected to coronavirus, um, you also might think about increasing acquisition right now to meet the needs um, and the desire of donors who want to help. You know, they want to help solve this problem. They want to have an impact um, and be part of the, the solution and recovery. And then some of those donors that you could acquire that way, those new donors could be your future mid and major donors and you know, work, your, work their way up the pyramid. So you know, the other question is, okay, once you get those new donors, what do you do with them to make sure they stay your donors um, and what's your retention strategy there? Um, so the point being, if you're seeing a good response to your mail and email and social media, you know, if you can help it, if you can afford it, don't scale back in this area, either with staffing or with the number of mailings you're doing or, um, you know, your vendor in this area. Yeah, and I think um, I sort of facetiously said we, we turned our noses up on it. And I think it's because so few people see that last point or are effective in that last point that you made, like, it is your feeder for your bigger gifts, right? Like, so if you're managing your, your, your direct response program the right way, Yes, it's generating revenue, but it's also generating your pipeline for the sort of relationship fundraising that we've all sort of made our careers on. Right. And also it's your potential feeder for planned gifts, right? Um, you know, we all know, or some, most of us know that your likeliest plan giving prospects are your donors making $100 gifts every year, but for 20 years, usually through your direct marketing program. So um, it hits all uh, parts of the pyramid. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of uh, whenever I see something that surprises me as sort of the, the, the um, success of direct response fundraising right now kind of has, I start to think about like what's really going on there. And I think to me, the wider point or the sort of lesson that we should try and pull to the rest of our fundraising is I think people that are good at telling their story are going to continue to do well and do better, right? Like I think I had this theory of like, there's a lot more competition on your time because like I could go have lunch with my daughter right now or I could talk to you all, right? So like there's these immediate sort of trade-offs. Um, so I think being able to tell a story that captures people is going to be much more important than ever before and people that do direct response typically do that pretty well. And secondly, I think brand is going to be more important than ever. I, I spent a lot of time saying, you know, nonprofits don't need to worry about or invest in sort of advertising or their brands and things like that. I have a completely different opinion. I think that's shifted over the years anyway. But like now it just sort of comes to the top of my list of if people understand your brand and they have a reaction and a response to it and a relationship with it, you're going to do much better in your fundraising, you know, immediately. Um, so that's, I don't, I don't know what that all means. Kelly, Kelly's about, you know, integrating digital and uh, direct mail written form is really vital. And that goes to brand as well. You know, make sure that the messaging is consistent and that it's sort of double teaming, you know, because donors, obviously are listening to different medias and different things get different attention. But at the end of the day, you want to move them to your website and, you know, generate a donation. So. Right. And the multi-channel approach has proven um, to be a better retention model as well. If donors are hearing from you in different ways, they're more likely to renew their gifts. Yeah. And just now I, now we're, we're going to belabor this point for one more, because I have like, 
the other thing is like a lot of times people will be like, oh, our social media, we don't worry about that. Our donors don't look at that. They do like, and you're silly if you don't think that they do like, right. You know, my my dad's on Facebook more than anybody else on the planet, right? Like they're they're looking at your social media, right? So um so the the messages need to need to align. So we have another question here that I wanted to sort of get to because it's been coming up a lot. Um, this one says our board leadership is asking for a lot more fundraising metrics. Um for uh, some of it's enroaching on the management of fundraisers. What are appropriate metrics to share with the board um, that show transparency but don't invite micromanaging? Um Regina, let's. What's your? Uh, why don't I completely put you on the spot? What do you? What do you think in terms of of, of 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 that? I think a strong dashboard for your board. You know, a one pager that summarizes uh, the activity. Um, you know, it doesn't need to include every single conversation that's had that week. But I think um, you know, showing. Uh, what you know activity has happened so um, if there's proposals that are going out the door if there have been uh, meaningful donor conversations and connections if there's any uh, gifts that are in conversation or possibility if in talking to your donors you've you've decided that there is a different um, uh, program or that their unrestricted gift is now okay to, you know restricted gift is okay to be unrestricted I put key points in there but I think you know, traditionally is where you are to go, where your regular, regular uh, projections are going to be. Those are going to be adjusted uh, probably on a monthly basis as opposed to a biannual basis right now. Um, and I think communicating that in your, you know, showing in a, in a visually appealing way to your board that's quick and simple and easy, how you're going to get to that goal, whether that be in major donors, corporations, et cetera, but whatever your outreach is and whatever that change has happened because of COVID, because of the pandemic, because of no event, et cetera, that needs to be you know, easily seen um, and showing that progress towards your revised goals, your revised projections. I was just gonna go to you, Steve, because I was gonna say, it's almost as if you sent this question in so we would have to talk about dashboards. So what, yeah, go, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, two, part, two parts, everything Regina just said I love because that's what we do. Uh, and I'm constantly talking about dashboards, as you all know, because everything you just said, Regina, is so true. The board can quickly, in a one-page summary, get where you are as an organization fundraising-wise. How many moves have you made? How many proposals are out? All the stuff. Uh, so 100% agree with everything you say. I have nothing more to add. Um, but another side of metrics uh, that you might also be asking about is, and I know boards are asking all the time, more and more so, as they should, and donors should as well. You know, what are the metrics of our actual program effectiveness? You know, how, um, for every dollar that we raise, you know, what's the actual impact on kids or on, um, you know, the healthcare industry or whatever, whatever our, wh whomever we're servicing? Um, you know, how exactly are we doing that? How much does it cost? Um, board, I think boards that are asking that and demanding more information about that are good boards. These days, if you're not doing that, I think you're behind the eight ball. And maybe at times like this, it's all, all the more important to justify, you know, why do we need to be giving at this level? And why, as a board, are we authorizing you to spend money to go out and find money because it's having such an amazing impact for the following reasons and in the, in the following ways. Metrics are important. And I think one other thing is, you know, beyond the bottom line, you know, other metrics that you can look at, especially right now, because to what Craig said earlier, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing as fundraisers right now in stewardship and relationship building and communications and maybe discussing blended gifts over time, we're not going to see that immediate money coming in the door. Right. So, you know, how do you show to your board that you are still working and you're still doing the, great, the good job as a fundraiser and fundraiser that will yield future results that, you know, needs to be looked at as well. I think to, to you know the underlying question of like how much is too much for the board to know, which was sort of baked into their question about metrics. It's like it's what we said before. Like if they're educated and and understand what they're looking at, I don't worry about anything that I share with the board. Right? Like they, I can be as transparent as possible, but they have to understand what they're looking at, right? So and those sort of like precursor metrics, like number of meetings, activity, pipeline value. Like I always equate those to like little orphan Annie, right? Like fundraisers are going to tell you the sun will come out tomorrow and the money will come in tomorrow. Those metrics are the things that should give a board confidence that you're doing the work to ensure that the sun will in fact come out tomorrow and that the money will come in. Um, but they have to understand that and they have to understand what's reasonable, right? So what you don't want, and I get it, is them looking at a thing and be like, well, Kelly only had two donor meetings. What's her problem? And it's like, well, Kelly was on maternity leave, you know, like, you know, whatever, like they need to understand like why, 
things are the way that they are. One thing that really helps was not on maternity leave, by the way. Is repetition, you know, educating and then repetition. So if every week or every board meeting or, you know, the development committee gets together and they, you start every meeting with what Regina suggested, a simple one page graphically pleasing um, set of metrics about here's where we are. This was our goal. We didn't quite make it. And here's why. Uh, because we didn't, we weren't able to get enough meetings. We didn't get enough proposals out. The proposals didn't hit the way we thought. Let's adjust. We're midstream right now. So this is what we do with clients, with partners, you know, every time we can is make these judgments. It's no one's fault until it is someone's fault. Uh, you know, in the first stage, it's not someone's fault. It's like, maybe we have the wrong process. Maybe we aren't doing it together as a team the way we should or whatever it is. But have these honest conversations, metrics, numbers, are a great way to bring it all out, eliminating the emotion, Craig, as you said. I think a lot of people get hung up too on like the um, sort of the perfect system, right? Like I, I don't have Salesforce, or I, you know, we don't right, use right. the CRM the right way. So they, they, they're like, we can't measure anything. So the first time I ever really measured activity goals for a staff, literally it was when you, because our CRM was, was trash, like most people's, but it was when you had a meeting, you had to fill out on a piece of paper who you met with and what it was about, and you literally put it in a box outside my office and I would look at them so I knew what was going on. And there was a little hash board, like whiteboard outside my office where we'd mark how many meetings everybody had every month, right? Like, so it doesn't have to be technologically driven. Don't do that because that was a lousy sort of system from like 19, you know, or 2001. But, you know, you can do better than that. But again, don't let the perfect stand in the way of measuring. A couple questions on here. Jennifer from Smile Farm. Um, Regina or, or and or Devin will get you exactly what you're asking for. They're looking for a sample dashboard and if others need that, just shoot us emails. Um, Steve, there's a questionnaire specifically for you. I'm trying to sort it out. What do you think? Is it good for the same approach, taking time to restructure, reconfigure? Strategy, we use the word strategy there. I love that. <laughs> All right, All right. What, do, what do you, I'm not even, well, so the question is, are you seeing donors applying the same approach to taking the time to restructure and configure since now is a terrible time to transact? Um, are the donors doing that? I don't know, but I can tell you for sure that it is time for nonprofits to do this. It could be simple and it could be uh, long ter longer term and, and aggressive and more costly. But essentially, restructuring involves the analytical uh, components of understanding what you're doing today and how much it costs versus what you could do tomorrow and the efficiency of getting to the dollar. You know, how's it changed? Things have really changed. So analyzing what you have been doing, analyzing what you could be doing in a numeric fashion is the right way to go. And so do the donor question is more like metrics and outcomes, I think, with uh, programmatic outcomes which is another part of the equation, but I'm in restructuring from a development point of view, I'm really talking about the construction of the development department and the focus on which type of donors. And Kelly, we would, we've been through a zillion development plans like this, which is really a restructuring plan, you know, where you're focused on the efficiency of, of a corporate versus a foundation versus an individual. And then we don't do government work, but the government piece, you know, they're all different. Different tactics, different times, uh, different staff needs, different uh, strategies, different strategery. All right. Well, on that note, we've come right up to two o'clock. I um, want to thank uh, our fantastic, my fantastic colleagues uh, for, for, for doing this. Thank you, everybody, for joining. More importantly, thank you for the work you do. Um, Nonprofit work hasn't gotten any easier in the last 10 weeks, and it wasn't that easy in the last 10 years, right? So um, but if you do good work, it changes the world. We appreciate it, even if... Uh, a lot of people don't, but um, keep it up and uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Next week is going to be a, a really great session. Steve's going to talk to a board member, Mike Galvin. Um, his family's got a long history of innovation. He's been devoting a lot of time on nonprofit boards. Um, please tune in for that. It's going to be great. Take care. Thanks.